And go back to Luke chapter 3 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 3. So if you, you're a visitor here, what we often do on a Sunday morning, we just go chapter by chapter throughout the whole Bible. Um, this ensures that we don't miss anything that's in the Bible. All right? Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is profitable. As we're going through that list of the names, guess what? That was profitable. All right? As we're going through that list of names, that was profitable as well. This is why we go chapter by chapter. And that way, you know, as a preacher, I'm not then afraid to, you know, like I try to skip something in the Bible because I don't like it. No. You know, I'm kind of forced to preach it no matter what. But look at Luke chapter 3, verse 6. Luke chapter 3, verse 6. The Bible says, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The title of the sermon this morning is See the Salvation of God. And of course, that salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. But we take a deviation from Luke chapter 2, which spoke about the birth of Christ. We're now back to John the Baptist. John the Baptist plays an important role through this chapter. Let's pick it up from verse number 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of uh, Ituria, and of the region of Tra- Traconitus, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of uh, Abilene, Abil- <laughs> Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. That John, the son, son of Zacharias, is what we commonly know as John the Baptist, okay? Now, the first thing I just want you to notice there, this is very unusual that's found there in verse number two, is that in the time of Jesus Christ, we've got Annas and Caiaphas as the high priests. Two high priests, that's what's, that's what's unusual. What you'll find in the Old Testament, the way God had ordered the house of the Lord, is that there would be one high priest, okay, one high priest. And of course, that first high priest was Aaron, the, the, the brother of Moses, and they would see out their period until death. And when they passed away, then, uh, you know, their, their, one of the, uh, one of the, sorry, um, the children would take over as the high priest. So it's quite unusual that we start off with two high priests. The Bible doesn't really tell us why that is. It does tell us that Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas. Okay. So they are related. And, um, my personal opinion, keep your finger there in Luke. Turn to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Turn to the last book of the Bible in Malachi and just the last two verses there. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Just the last book of the, of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. I think this illustrates to us the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. Okay? We know when Christ came, they were spiritually darkened. In fact, God had to send a messenger, okay, the the, the cousin of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, to prepare the way of the Lord, okay? Israel had lost their way. They were spiritually darkened, and as we see later on with the religious leaders, they weren't even saved, okay? Their father, Jesus Christ, talks about them. The Pharisees, uh, their their father was of the devil, okay, was the devil. But so we, we pick up the story here when Jesus Christ enters into uh, Judea, that look, the nation of Israel was in a dark spiritual state. Look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. The Bible, this is how the Old Testament ends. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, if you know your Bibles, Elijah, in the spirit of Elijah, is a reference to John the Baptist. Okay? John the Baptist was in the same spirit like Elijah was in the Old Testament. And look at verse number 6. This is something we obviously know about John the Baptist in the New Testament. It says, And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers. Okay, he came preparing a way for the Lord. And then look at this. Why did God send John the Baptist before Jesus Christ started his ministry? At the end of it says, Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right? So, you know, God knew the spiritual state of Israel. If Jesus Christ had come without the the forerunner there, John the Baptist, that he would be so angered by the spiritual state that they were in, that he would come and bring a curse. Instead of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and, and being that curse for us, taking upon the curse of the law, 
he would come and curse the earth again. And that's why he had to come and send that forerunner, John the Baptist, to prepare a new generation that would be ready to receive Jesus Christ as he came onto the scene. Okay, And so I think, in my personal opinion, the reason why we have two high priests, it just shows us that they're no longer following the laws of God. They're no longer trying to uh, keep the Old Testament laws and the commands the way God had passed them down generation after generation. Okay. Now, before we get into the rest of this chapter, this is a long chapter, there's a lot of information. The challenge with Luke chapter 3, well, it's not really a challenge. Like, if, if, you're, if you're newly saved and you've heard sound preaching, all you've done is read the Bible and you, you've not been corrupted by false teaching, this is actually a very easy chapter to get through. But for those that are false prophets and false teachers that want to add works of the works of the law to salvation, they'll often take Luke chapter 3 and teach their damnable heresies. Okay, So I just want to cover a few fundamental things before we get into the rest of the chapter. Three very basic fundamental truths of the Bible. First of all, salvation. Right? The title was, See the Salvation of the Lord. Jesus Christ is our salvation. Hey, how are we saved? We know about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but how do we receive the salvation? How is that received? How is that free gift of God received? Many people will come up with many different answers. Okay? But let's talk about some fundamentals here of the doctrine of the Bible. John 3.16. We don't need to turn there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever what? Believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What's the condition for salvation? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Salvation is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16, verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. All right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay? Salvation is by putting our faith, our belief, 100% on Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith. All right? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? Those that believe that it's by works are the same that boast of themselves. Hey, I'm a good person. I've kept the laws of God. I go to church. I've been baptized. Hey, that's not going to get you saved. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, right? Salvation is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by faith. And I just want to read to you Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, okay, not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. All right? Do I believe in the works of the law? Do I believe in the commandments? Yes, we should strive to do those things. But when it comes to salvation, the salvation of your eternal soul, hey, it's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's not based on your, uh, uh, you know, on your works, okay, which are filthy rags in the sight of God. So we understand what salvation is. We don't need to go into that too much more. What about repentance? Well, a lot of people say, well, to be saved, you can't, you know, yes, you need to believe on Christ, but you also need to repent. Of course, you need to repent. Okay? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But what is repentance? Okay? It's going from one place to another. Okay? You're, you're changing from one thing to another. And what that is, is dependent upon the context that you're reading. We often hear about the term, repent of your sins, right? Turning from your sins. Am I for turning from your sins? Absolutely. What kind of Bible preacher would I be if I did not believe you had to turn from your sins? But do you have to turn from your sins to be saved? Hey, what does that mean, right? Let's, let's talk, let's think about this for a minute, all right? If we know that salvation is believing on Jesus Christ, His finished work, and then we talk about repentance in context of salvation, what are we talking about? Let's think about it. There are people, you know, a lot of you guys knock doors, preach the gospel, and you ask them, hey, how can you, how, what makes you sure that you're going to heaven? What do they say? I'm a good person. 
All right. So what is their faith in? Jesus Christ? No, in their works. So what do they need to repent of? The faith in themselves, the faith of believing that their works will get them to heaven and place their faith on Jesus Christ. Okay? Others will say, I know I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to heaven because of my, let's, let's say, false religion, false church, whatever it is, whatever, you know, whatever's not Jesus Christ. Okay? What do they need to repent of? They need to repent of their false gods. They need to repent of their false religion. Okay? What are we referring to here? Their faith, what they believe. They need to stop trusting in their church and start trusting 100% in Jesus Christ. Okay? You notice that it's not works. It is faith that they need to repent. Okay? When it comes to repentance to salvation, it is your faith, where that is placed, because we know what salvation is. All right? And of course, just the one that doesn't believe, has no belief, they need to repent from unbelief to belief on Jesus Christ. Every time you repent, you're repenting from something to something else. There's a two-part process there. And Mark 1.15 says, And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. What's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you need to believe the gospel and it said repent ye, what are you repenting from? Not believe in the gospel, right? Not believe in the gospel. Repent ye, believe the gospel. All right? Because if you believe that salvation is by a repentance of your sins, a turning from your sins, then this is what you're essentially saying. We've already said that salvation is not by the works of the law, right? It's not by keeping the commandments. But if you start saying, well, you've got to turn from your sins to be saved, then what are you saying? Let, let's, 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 let's fill in some sins there. Well, you need to turn or repent from lying to be saved. Well, if that's the case, what are you actually asking them to do? You're asking them to, ke to keep commandment number nine of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not bear false witness. So what are you saying? If, you, if you're telling someone you've got to repent from lying to be saved, you're telling them you've got to keep the laws of God. You've got to keep the works of the law to be saved. Hey, salvation is not by the works of the law, okay? If you say, well, you know, let's say there's a couple committing adultery. And you say, well, to be saved, you know, it's not just believing on Jesus, but you've got to stop committing adultery. Now, should they stop committing adultery? Absolutely. But is that, is the, is them stopping or not stopping part of salvation? No. Because if you tell them you need to turn from adultery, you're asking them to keep commandment number seven. All right? And if you say to them, hey, you've got to turn from covetousness, okay, from desiring things that do not belong to you, you're asking them to keep commandment number ten. All right, and so on and so forth. Hey, every time you're asking somebody to turn from a particular sin, you're asking them to keep the works of the law. And salvation is not by the works of the law. It's by faith. Okay? We need to understand these basic concepts before we get to the rest of Luke chapter 3. Let's talk about baptism very quickly. John the Baptist. Baptism, right? When should you get baptized? After you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is the death of burial and resurrection you are identifying with the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ once you have placed your faith upon that you make a public confession in a sense by following that command that jesus christ gave us but whether you get baptized or not plays no role in your salvation okay your salvation is by faith it's by believing on the lord jesus christ okay now when should you get baptized as a little baby as a little child sprinkling we won't go into all that right now no, the Bible is very clear. Acts 8.36, when uh, Philip came to the Ethiopian eunuch and, and preached the gospel to him, the Ethiopian eunuch said this to him, As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me or what prevents me to be baptized? So he wants to get baptized. Hey, what's preventing him? What's hindering him? And Philip said in verse 37, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest so what's the condition to get baptized you must first believe with all your heart right and then you can get baptized uh and he answered this is the ethiopian eunuch and he answered and said i believe that jesus christ is the son of god all right so we see first salvation believing on jesus christ you're saved it's done it's based on the works of, of christ not on your performance then in obedience you should get baptized, water baptized, okay? It follows salvation. 
Even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, the Old Testament type, when Israel was delivered out of Egypt, right? And then what happened? They passed through the Red Sea. Remember that story? When Moses parted the, 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 the sea and they walked through dry land. The New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Speaking of Israel passing through the Red Sea. And then it says this in verse 2. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So we have a picture of Israel being delivered out of Egypt. Then they pass through the Red Sea, which is a type of baptism. An Old Testament type of the New Testament baptism. So you, you notice that the deliverance came first, or the salvation came first, then the baptism. All right? Basic things that anybody should know. And if you, if you haven't grasped these things, I recommend that you, uh, I haven't got the DVDs here, but I recommend you go on YouTube and just go through the fundamentals of our church, the fundamentals of our faith, okay? Now, let's get back to Luke chapter 3. Let's get back to Luke chapter 3. Because whatever we read here must be consistent with these fundamental truths of Christianity. Okay, must be. You can't just read a passage and go, well, that sounds different. I'm going to go with that view. No, you stick to the fundamental truths. You stick to the black and white scriptures, all right, and you don't wrestle the scriptures. You, you follow through. And again, this really shouldn't be difficult if you just knew the fundamental truths and you just read your Bible, okay? Verse number three, verse number three, Luke 3, 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Ooh, John the Baptist came preaching the baptism of repentance. Let's think about those words. Now, keep your finger there. Turn to Acts 19. Acts 19. Because I don't want to give you my opinion as to what this preaching is. Okay? Acts 19. Turn to Acts 19. And if you're wondering, why are we turning to the book of Acts? Well, if you're here for chapter 1 of Luke, we learned that the book of Acts was written by Luke as well. Okay? Written to the same person, to uh, the most excellent Theopolis. Okay? It was written to the, a man that was already saved. Okay? And both the book of Luke and the book of Acts is written by the same person, by Luke. So, of course, we'd find this consistency anyway. In Acts 19, verse 4. Acts 19, verse 4. What does it say here? Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, look at this, what is he saying to the people? That they should believe on him that should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Hey, what is the baptism of repentance? Believe on Jesus. It's the gospel. All right? And yet we will find these false teachers and false prophets taking this uh, baptism of repentance and teaching people you've got to repent from your sins. You need to turn from your sins to be saved. Where is that in the Bible? That phrase does not even exist in the Bible, repent of your sins. Am I all for repent of your sins? Yes, I am. Don't misunderstand. But it's for the believer. We should live a life of continual repentance. Okay, Because we have a sinful nature, we're going to commit sin for the rest of our life, unfortunately. Hey, But we should strive to live holy lives not to be saved, because salvation is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but to maintain a close fellowship with the Lord, live holy and blameless lives, and to please God the Father. Okay? And ultimately to earn rewards in heaven. Okay? But that is not salvation. Okay? We see the baptism of repentance here, defined for us in Acts 19.4, that they should believe on Him, that should come after Him. That is Jesus Christ. Go back to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 4. Luke chapter 3, verse 4. So what's, what's John the Baptist preaching? He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the gospel. Verse number 4. As it is written in the words, in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. Quickly turn to chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Luke chapter 1, verse 76. This is Zacharias speaking of John the Baptist. What did he say about John the Baptist? His own son. In Luke 1, 76. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. Now, next, look at the next words. For thou shalt go before the face of the, of the Lord to prepare his ways. What's thou? It's a singular. Okay? He's speaking to John the Baptist. John the Baptist will prepare the ways of the Lord. Verse 77. How does he prepare the ways? Verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation 
unto his people by the remission of their sins. Hey, he was preaching salvation, all right? And it was a task that was given to John the Baptist. Now go back to Luke chapter 3. Notice the thou in Luke 1, which is singular. Go back to Luke 3, look at verse 4 again. Verse 4, the second half of that. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. What's ye? Plural. You all. Okay? So, John the Baptist came preaching the gospel, right? Then when they got saved, what's he teaching them now? Ye go and prepare the way of the Lord. You go and prepare, the, you go and preach the gospel now. Okay? You go and spread this word. Don't let it just be me. Yes, I was tasked with this, but now ye are to go out preparing the ways of the Lord. All right? And I'll just quickly read to you from John 140. This is an example of this. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter's, Simon Peter's brother. And first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which has been interpreted the Christ. So we see here Andrew following through this, right? He hears the preaching, he gets saved, and then he goes and gets his brother and says, Hey, we found him, we found Messiah, let's go. All right? So we see this play out in the Bible. Now, look at verse number 5, Luke 3, 5. Luke 3, 5. And uh, <clears throat> every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall, shall see the salvation of the Lord. So when it talks about the, the, the valleys being filled, uh, the mountains and the hills being brought low, okay, this is figurative language, because the sentence hasn't finished, it goes to verse number 6, which says, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now think about this. Think about this. Who's to see the salvation of the Lord? All flesh. The people, right? So when we're talking about these mountains being brought low and the valleys being filled, we're referring to people. Think about the gospel, right? When we go out and we preach the gospel, those that think they're good enough to be saved, those that think they're keeping the works of the law, what are they filled with? Pride. Right? Lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, right? Lest any man, they're, they're being boastful, they're being prideful. They're like these hills, they're like these mountains. And the only way they're going to receive the gospel is if they're brought low, right? If they're taken down a peg, right? And that's why we say to them, yes, look, you might be good in the, in the sight of men, but next to God, you've, you come short of the glory of God, right? And, and we need to bring them low and make them realize, hey, you're right, I'm a sinner, I'm not perfect, and I need salvation. And so those that have been prideful, thinking they're saved because of their own abilities, hey, they need to be brought low. And then it says here, uh, and, the, and uh, every valley shall be filled. So those that already are humble enough and realize, yeah, you know what, I'm not a good person. You know, uh, you know I can't make it to heaven on my own. They're, they're low. They're like a valley that's low. And they shall be filled, right? Because they, they get the good news of the gospel, they know the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that brings them up, brings them up to the level of Christ. What, what, what this is saying is, hey, salvation is a great leveler. No matter who you are in society, no matter if you're rich or poor, if, you, if you're full of pride or you're very humble, hey, salvation is the same way. It's through Jesus Christ. And, and in Christ, there's a, it's level, okay? I'm not better than you, and you're not better than me, because we're saved through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's, I'm not comparing my righteousness to yours. Hey, who's going to make it to heaven? No, we can all just be humble and say, hey, thank God for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That gets me there. It's a great leveler. Okay, that's what I believe we're seeing there in verses 5 and 6. Look at verse 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. Okay, so the multitude's coming to get baptized. Think about this, right? Are they saved? They, they should be if they're coming to get baptized, right? Baptism comes after salvation. But look at the words here. And this is where it gets a little confusing. O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, it sounds like he's being really cruel. These multitudes turn up and he calls them generation of vipers. Hey, but is he talking to everybody? No. Keep your finger there. Let's compare scripture with scripture. Go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. 
This is another uh, record of John the Baptist preaching the same message to those that came to get baptized. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Keep your finger there in Luke 3. Matthew 3, verse 7. The Bible says, And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So you see how when we compare Scripture to Scripture, these things come to light. Who is he referring to when he calls them the generation of vipers? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders that thought they could be saved because they're a child of Abraham. Hey, I'm a child of Abraham. I'm saved. No. All right. God is able to use these stones and raise up children for himself, he says, right? I mean, that's pretty insulting, right? You're, you're better off being a, a, a stone. Right? God can make your child fruit through stones, you know, and, and they're worse than that, right? They're worse than that. It's pretty insulting. He calls them a generation of vipers. Jesus Christ also calls them a generation of vipers twice in the New Testament, both times referring to the Pharisees, okay? The religious leaders of the day, those that were preaching a false religion. And uh, so we need to understand this in the context there. Go back to Luke 3. Luke 3. Luke 3, speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, just keep that in mind. Verse 9, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not good, uh, forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. What's this fire? It's, it's hell fire. Okay? If these Pharisees are still thinking of themselves as, well, I'm saved because I'm Abraham's seed, hey, they've, they've got to come and bring fruits uh, Worthy of repentance. Now, keep your finger there. Go to Matthew 7. Go to Matthew 7, verse 15. Because we need to understand it. What does it mean? We don't want to just start making things up. What does it mean to have this tree that's cut down at the roots and I just start giving you my opinion? No, the Bible defines itself. Okay, the Bible defines itself. Matthew 7, verse 15. Matthew 7, verse 15. Remember, he's addressing the Pharisees. Okay, Matthew 7, 15. The Bible says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot uh, bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, the same words, that John the Baptist said, right, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, I didn't intend to really go into this in any depth, but let me just turn. Let's keep reading there. Uh, Matthew 7. Let me just find my place here. Matthew 7, verse 21. Because the question is, what are these fruits? Ah, you've got to turn from your sins to be saved. That's the fruits. Well, hold on. Let's keep reading. What are the fruits? What is the bad tree that brings forth the bad fruit? Look at verse 21, Matthew 7, 21. Um, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Okay, now, what is it? Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. Let's stop there for a minute. What is this bad fruit? They're coming around saying, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied. Hey, we preach. We're preachers. We've preached in your name. Hey, we've cast out devils. Now, does the Bible say they cast out devils? No. They're saying they cast out devils. Right? They're saying they cast out devils. But look at, look at the end of it. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Hey, what are they trusting in? The works, the many wonderful works. Okay, keep reading. Uh, Verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Hey, what is the bad tree producing? People that are trusting in their works for salvation. People that are trusting in their repentance of sins for salvation. That's the bad fruit that's been produced. You come to Christ and say, I've done many wonderful works. Christ is going to say to you, I never knew you. He never knew. It's not like you lost your salvation. 
He never knew you. You were never saved to begin with. Okay? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Okay? So we need to address these things. The Bible is very clear about what that bad fruit is. People preaching that salvation is by works and, and, and uh, having converts that are trusting in their works for salvation. All right? That is one sure way to know a false prophet. If they're teaching works for salvation, all right? or their converts believe it's by works. Back to Luke chapter 3, please. Luke chapter 3. Verse 10. Verse 10. Now, I want to make this clear. Right? Uh, so, sorry, let's go, uh, let's look at um, Luke chapter 3, verse, verse 8. Okay? So we're, we're talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Hey, what are they required to do? They're required to repent, right? Otherwise, they're going to go into the lake of fire, be, be thrown into the fire, right? So what is that repentance that they need to do? And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. So what do they have to repent from? Trust in that they're going to heaven because Abraham's their father, right? For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Hey, that makes sense. That makes sense what we understand about the gospel, about salvation. Their faith was in themselves. Their faith was in their lineage. Their faith was in their genealogy. And they have to transfer or repent from that faith and put their faith on the one that would come after John the Baptist, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice that the repentance there is what they're trusting in, where their faith is at, what they believe in. Okay? Now, when we get to verse number 10, because now this is where it gets confusing for some people, because now John the Baptist starts preaching works. Hey, but is this is works for salvation? No. You see this other group of people that he's preaching to. Remember, there's a multitude. There's a whole bunch of people. Some are unsaved devils. All right. Some are unsaved Pharisees that still can get saved if they repent. And then there are still and there are others that are already saved. They come to be baptized. Baptism is after salvation. All right. Verse number ten. And this is, this is another group of people. And the people asked him, saying, "What shall we do then?" Okay, we know what the Pharisees need to do. They need to get saved. But now that we're saved, what do we do then? All right? Verse 11. He answereth and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him, that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. So basically, just to summarize, love your neighbor. It's better to give than to receive. Be generous. If someone has a need and you can fulfill that need, you know, do so. All right? He's preaching them. Look, do you have to? If, if you start lumping this in with salvation... Do you need to find someone that needs a coat and, and give it to them to be saved? Is that salvation? Of course not. Okay? But this is works. This is after salvation. Right? Verse 12. Verse 12. Then came also publicans. So these are people that work for the government, like uh, our friend Jason there. <laughs> then, then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? Okay, they're coming to be baptized. Remember, they're already saved. They're coming to get baptized now. Right? What shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. Hey, so be honest in your dealings. Don't commit extortion. You know, that kind of thing. Again, works, right? Verse 14. And the soldiers, so we have Roman soldiers here. Now, I don't know if they're, they're obviously Roman soldiers because we know the state of the nation at this point, but they might have been, they may have been Jewish Roman soldiers, okay? Because the Roman Empire enlisted people of that region as well to serve uh, as a soldier. But anyway. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And, and I love this, because anyone, this is, a good, this is a good preaching for any police officer, anyone that holds authority in, in, in civil matters, right? Because this is, this is what they fail in, right? And we see this in the Bible, we still see this today. What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man. Right? Don't violate people. All right? Yeah, do your job, do what you need to do, but don't overstep the boundaries and start killing people, right? Start violating. Take things that don't belong to you. Neither accuse any falsely. Hey, stop lying. Stop making false reports. All right? And be content with your wages. Stop complaining about how much money you make. All right? These are things that I think are still applicable to the police force or any kind of authority that society raises up above, you know, the common citizen. All right? So, again, it's works. All right? It's works. These people are saved. They're coming to get baptized. All right, they're saved. What shall we do? Their works, right? But notice again, the Pharisees, they need, to tr they need to repent in context of their faith, what they were trusting in. These that are already saved, yeah, they need to repent as well. They need to do better. They need to live whole lives, but they're already saved. 
they're coming to get baptized. All right? We need to understand the differences here. Now, um, if you think, uh, nah, you know what, you're, you're, you're making, you're, 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 you know, that's not what the Bible reads, you're making that up. Keep your finger there, go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, let's just confirm this in the scriptures. Luke chapter 7 verse 28. Luke chapter 7 verse 28. Luke chapter 7 verse 28. This is now Jesus speaking of John the Baptist. Okay, speaking of John the Baptist. He says in Luke 7 28, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. I won't go into that right now. I just want to give you the context there. But look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. Pay attention. And all the people that heard him and the publicans, remember the publicans came to get baptized? Were they already saved? Justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. What does it mean to justify God? It means you, 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 you're, what they're saying is, what we heard from John the Baptist, the greatest prophet, is justified. It comes from God. What he was preaching, the gospel, the salvation, it was just, it was right, it was correct, which is why they were then baptized by John, right? Then look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. All right? So we do see, even later on in Jesus' ministry, this division of people that came to John the Baptist. Some did not believe the gospel, and of course they were not baptized. Those that did believe, we saw a group of them, some of them being the publicans, they were saved and they, they justified God, it was right, they got baptized. So, you know, we see it play out later on that Luke chapter 3 is speaking about two groups of people, the unsaved and the saved, okay? Don't get that confused, okay? Otherwise, you're going to start confusing what the gospel is. Go back to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. And I know I'm, I know I'm speeding. There's a lot to cover here, guys. I'm going to try. But look, if you have any questions after the service, you can feel free to ask me. Luke chapter 3, verse 15. Luke chapter 3, verse 15. So this proves, verse 15 proves that he's preaching the gospel, that he's preaching about Jesus Christ. And as the people were in expectation, so they're expecting, we'll see Christ, and all men mused in their hearts of John whether he was the Christ or not. So he's preaching about Christ coming, right? And people are hearing this, and they're like, I wonder if, it, I wonder if it's actually John the Baptist himself or not, right? So that confirms that their hope, their trust is in Christ that's coming. But John the Baptist clarifies this in verse 16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will freely purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now notice verse 17. It confirms for us that there are the lost there, and that there are saved. Because verse 17 says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will pur thoroughly, thoroughly pur purge his floor, he will gather the wheat into his garner. So, the Lord's going to come and, and, and gather his wheat, right? And I believe that's figurative later on of being gathered together in the clouds with the Lord. That's one group. But then he says after, um, but the chaff, that which is burnt up, he will burn with fire unquenchable. And that's a reference to hellfire. That's a reference to hell. There's two groups there, right? The, the wheat that the Lord gathers and then that, that which is cast into the fire. All right? Now, <clears throat> just a few thoughts here. Verse 16 it says that Jesus Christ, so John Baptist baptized with water, but Jesus coming, is coming baptizing with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, Brother Jason did a great sermon called Filled with the Spirit. He goes, Filled with the Spirit. And he, if, if you want a bit more information in this concept of being baptized by the Holy Ghost, I recommend you go and listen to that. But I just want to point out this, that well, first of all, that when you are saved, you are baptized by the Holy Ghost. Because the whole, you're born of the Holy Spirit. You're born again. And the Holy Ghost comes and indwells the believer. All right? But notice that it says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, prior to that sermon, I used to, and I didn't really study it out all that much, but I used to just assume that the Holy Ghost and fire was a reference to the day of Pentecost. Because on the day of Pentecost, they, in, they are indeed baptized by the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, but also there's a cloven tongue of fire that appears above their heads. If you guys remember that story. Um, and so I, that's what I just generally thought. But uh, Brother Jason mentioned that the fire here is a reference to being cast into the lake of fire. And I hadn't really thought about that. 
And, um, and it, verse 17, because the, the sentence does not finish in verse 16. Notice there's a colon. So verse 17 then talks about that fire that's unquenchable. Okay, The chaff. If you read in the Bible, whenever you look up the word chaff, it's always talking about the ungodly, always talking about the wicked that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. And that chaff will burn with fire unquenchable. So the context does lend to the idea here that the baptism of fire is being cast into the lake of fire. Okay? But of course, when I heard that, what are we supposed to do? When you hear something new and you're not sure, hey, what are we supposed to do as believers? Do we just accept what's preached behind the pulpit? No, we should go back to the scriptures and confirm, is this true? Is this correct? And the fact that I didn't go back to you, Jason, means that I agreed with you, right? <laughs> All right. But I just want to prove this a little bit and just show you this because in the three gospels, this is mentioned. Okay, In the three gospels, this, this teaching is mentioned. Go to Matthew chapter 3. Again, keep your finger there in Luke 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. So as you're turning there, remember, unquenchable fire is mentioned. Baptized by, the, by fire is mentioned. And the rebuke to the Pharisees. Okay, the wicked, ungodly, unsaved is mentioned, right? We saw that in Luke chapter 3. Look at Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism... He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So we have there that same reference to the generation of vipers, the, the Pharisees. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think to, not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also is the axe laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So now we have that second mention, right? Baptize the Holy Ghost and with fire. Lines up with Luke chapter 3, right? Then verse number 12, whose fan is in his hand and he will freely purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we see again that unquenchable fire fire right we see the, that we see the baptism of fire and we see the generation of vipers that is being preached against that lines up perfectly with luke chapter 3 now turn to mark chapter 1 mark chapter 1 verse 5 mark chapter 5 sorry mark chapter 1 verse 5 mark chapter 1 verse 5 mark chapter 1 verse 5 and notice the difference notice the difference here mark chapter 1 verse 5 and there went out unto him all the land of judea and they of jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchlet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You notice what's missing there? And with fire. Missing? The unquenchable fire, if you read on, it's not there. And the generation of vipers are not there. And so uh, I believe that is the correct interpretation, by the way, Brother Jason. And so when the generation of vipers are mentioned and, and the threat of not believing the gospel is that you'll be cast into the lake of fire, makes sense. But in, in the book of Mark, he doesn't see fit for whatever reason to record that conversation. And so he, 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 misses, he, he uh, leaves out the baptism with fire. Okay? And so that shows that correlation between those other things. I hope that makes sense. If, again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Back to Luke chapter 3. Back to Luke chapter 3. I better hurry up a little. Verse 18. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. So there are many other things that John the Baptist preached. He wasn't just baptizing. He wasn't just preaching the gospel. He was preaching many things. And then verse 19 is one example of what he preached. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So what else did John the Baptist preach? Against divorce, against remarriage. This guy took his brother's wife, and John the Baptist is preaching against it. Hey, John the Baptist, Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. All right? He was a great man. Hey, he was a preacher of God, right? He's a great preacher of God. And if you have a desire to be a pastor, to be a preacher, then you need to follow after the examples that we have in the Bible. You ought to follow after the examples that we have of John the Baptist. Was he just preaching love? 
Is that all he was preaching? No, he had a balanced diet of preaching, right? He preached the gospel. Then he preached those that got saved. You go and preach the gospel, right? And then he preached against the false prophets of the day, the false teachers, the Pharisees, and said, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Stop trusting. Hey, he preached against those that are trusting in their genealogy as a descendant of Abraham that they're saved just by that. Hey, he preached that, right? And then he preached good works. He preached generosity. He preached loving your neighbor. He preached giving a coat to those that, that require one. He preached, hey, uh, be content with your wages. He, pre- he preached contentment. Hey, he preached against re- divorce and remarriage. I mean, remarriage. Hey, if you want to be a preacher of God, you must be a balanced preacher. All right? If all you preach is the gospel, just sit down and let someone else take over. Now, that's important. Okay? But we need to, we need to cover all these things. You need to preach about hellfire. You can't just preach, you can't just preach salvation without talking about the dangers of hell should you reject Jesus Christ. Okay? You need to call out the false prophets, the false teachers. Okay? Oh, that's not loving. Then John the Baptist wasn't loving. Then Jesus wasn't loving. Hey, these men of God, these great preachers, had a balanced diet of preaching. You need all these things. But if all you're doing is preaching against false prophet week in, week out, then you're not balanced either. You need all these aspects, right? The gospel, soul winning, preaching against false prophets, preaching good works, okay? Uh, preaching against marriage and, uh, remarriage, remarriage and divorce, okay? We need to cover all these bases if you want to be a preacher of God. Luke 3.21, Luke 3.21. And now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, thou art my beloved son in thee. I am well pleased. We have the baptism of Jesus Christ, right? This is the one that would come after John Baptist, the salvation of the Lord. And what do we see in the baptism of Jesus? We see Jesus going into the water, getting baptized. We see the Holy Ghost descending bodily like a dove. Um, my personal opinion on that is that the Holy Spirit looked like a dove as he descended. All right? Some other people have some different interpretations like he, he descended bodily and like a dove is in the manner that he descended. Like he may have looked like a human body, but the way he descended was like a dove. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Right? But we have the Holy Ghost there. And then we have the voice in heaven which said, This is my beloved Son. Who's speaking? If Jesus Christ is His beloved Son, it's God the Father speaking. Hey, we have the Trinity in place here at the baptism of Jesus Christ. The Trinity is emphasized in all the passages that deal with the baptism of Jesus Christ. And you might ask, well, when you baptize someone, do you baptize someone by the name of Jesus only? No. When we baptize someone... We baptize them by the, in the name, the instructions that Jesus left us in Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Okay, all free. All right, all free. And then someone say, well, hold on, in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts it says they were baptized in Jesus' name. Yeah, but understand that the name, the name is not only a personal name. Name also means authority. Name also means power. Like the name, you know, stop by the, in the name of the law. Name. The law doesn't have a personal name. It's the authority, it's the power of the law which that person wants to stop, right? And so when we talk about someone in the a book of Acts that was baptized in Jesus' name, what they're referring to is that they were baptized by the authority that Jesus Christ left us, found in Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which reflects what we see with Jesus Christ's baptism, right? All these things come together and make perfect sense. Now, we're left with the uh, genealogy now, right? The genealogy. Look at verse 23, Luke 3, 23. And I'm not going to read it through it all, uh, but I just want to bring some things to your attention. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Hey, was he the biological son of Joseph? No, he was born of his mother, who was a virgin at that time, right? The son of God, but those around him that grew up with him, that knew him, family, you know, the community, supposed, thought of him as the son of Joseph. And then as you read through this chronolo- chron- uh, chronology, it says uh, which was the son of, which was the son of, which was the son of, as Tim did very well uh, reading for, for us. Now, go to um, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Let's look at the other chronology that exists for Jesus Christ. Let's compare the two. Matthew chapter 1. 
and I'm almost done now, but Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. Actually, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 first. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So when we go to the chronology in Matthew, we see what is trying to be emphasized here. That is the son of David, that's King David, and the son of Abraham. Okay? Abraham uh, had the promises uh, to him and to his seed. The Bible says that seed, which is Christ, in Galatians chapter 3. We won't go into that right now. But notice that when we get to verse 16, it says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, if you read through that chrono chronology, it doesn't say the son of, the son of, the son of. It says, begat, begat, begat. All right? Now, I've got 10 kids. All right? Now, well, let's talk about my sons for a minute. I've got seven sons, and they're all begotten of me as well. Okay? Now, what, what does it, which one carries more weight? Which one speaks of biology, of procreation, of genealogy, generation? What, which one of those speak of it? That is my son, or that he was begotten of me? That which was begotten of me, right? Because begotten is to bring forth, to bring into existence, all right? So my children, my sons, were brought forth through my genes, right? From being intimate with my wife, my wife giving birth. Their genes, I, I carried, carry my genes and my wife's genes, right? We, we, beget, we begot these children, okay? But if I were to adopt, let's say, one of the Mitchell kids, we, we adopt Brody, right, into the family, you know, and he legally became my son, I could call him my son, right? He'd be my son, right? But did I beget him? No, okay? His genes would not be the family genes, but he'd be my son, right? Now, let's think about this a little bit more. Um, what about when my daughter, you know, Isabel, hopefully gets married one day? Guess what? When she gets married, I'm going to have another son, aren't I? Yeah, my son-in-law, my son-in-law. Hey, he's my son, but did I beget that son-in-law? No, right? No. So I just want you to think about these things. When we come to these two genealogies, one is that uh, physical uh, uh, passing down of a genealogy, begetting someone. The other one then references the son. Now, the reason is it's, 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 um, it's because there, there is a difference between the two genealogies. There's a difference, okay? Now, when we look at the genealogy there in, in uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter, look at verse 116 again. It says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. So who was the father of Joseph? Jacob, right? Jacob is the father of Joseph. Jacob beget or begot uh, Joseph. Okay, so he uh, is the reason uh, that Joseph exists. All right? Now go back to Luke chapter 3. Go back to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, was he actually begotten of Joseph? Right now. Which was the son of Heli. Hold on, the other one said Jacob. This one says Heli or, or Eli, Eli. Okay? So the genealogy that we have here in Luke chapter 3 is not the generation of uh, Joseph, the Joseph's line, but that of Mary. Okay? Mary who married Joseph, and of course, the Bible talks about marriage being of one flesh, and Heli was the father-in-law of Joseph, all right? And that also passes through, we won't go into it all now, eventually goes back to King David, back to Abraham, and all the way back to Adam, okay? All the way back to Adam. So what we see in the book of Matthew, we see that it goes through the, the line of David, King David, but also through the kingly line. So it's not just David, but then Solomon, his son, and then Solomon's son, uh, uh, Jeroboam. All right? Oh, no. Ah, forgot his name. Anyone remember it? Rehoboam. That's right. Yeah, sorry. The king of Judah. And um, so Matthew confirms that Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews and follows that kingly line, okay, through Joseph. But Joseph was not his biological father. But still, it was important that Joseph did marry Mary to keep that lineage, right? It was important, that genealogy. But then, if someone were to criticize that and go, well, you're not really of Joseph and wanted to trace it down Mary's line, well, Mary also, her genealogy goes all the way back to King David, but not through the kingly line. It goes through another son of his. 
and then back to Abraham and beyond Abraham, okay? Because many of the Hebrews or the, or the Jews consider Abraham their father, and then we have a lineage in Matthew of, of the Israelites, okay? But what's great about the book of Luke, it goes beyond that and goes into the Gentiles. In fact, Abraham was actually a Gentile, okay? So was uh, um, Isaac, okay? And then Jacob, his name was changed, right, by God to Israel. What are the Israelites? The children of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel under um, Jacob. Jacob was Israel, but Abraham, his grandfather, was not an Israelite because he was not a child of Israel, okay? He actually was a Gentile, and obviously all the way back to Adam, they're all Gentile nations, okay? The point I just want to bring there is that Jesus is not just the Savior of the Jews, not just the Savior of the physical nation of Israel, but also the Savior of all mankind, okay, of, of, of all, you know, Jew or Gentile, you know, a Savior, but he also came forth in his genealogy from both Israelites and Gentiles, okay? Um, I think that's all I've got for you guys uh, today. Oh, yeah, just one, one, more, one more thing, just, just in Luke, Luke chapter 3, okay, Luke chapter 3. Because notice that Luke chapter 3, um, verse... Verse 31, Luke chapter 3, verse 31, it says, which was the son of Melia, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Metatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David, King David. So Jesus was the son of David, right? We just confirmed that, right? But then when you go, when you follow all the way through back to verse 38, down to verse 38, Luke 3, 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Hey, who created Adam? God, but who was the creator? When God the Father created all things, He did it through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And in Revelation 22, 16, Jesus says of Himself, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Yes, He's the offspring of King David but he's also the root of King David, right? Because it's, it's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who created all things and created Adam and down that lineage goes. All right, let's pray.